This is the day the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty God, we confess that we have taken your name in vain. We have called on your name in prayer, but without sincerity. We have uttered your name countless times without reverence or love. We have listened to others use your name in vain without grieving. Forgive us, dear Lord, and make us whole. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Hear these words from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. These are words that you may trust, words that merit full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is the good news of the gospel. Therefore, let us sing to the glory of God.
God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name I come to you to share his love as he told. My friends, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he should come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray together. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you taught us to pray and to offer our petitions to you in his name. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that our prayers for others may serve your will and show your steadfast love. Hear us as we pray for the world. You made all things in your wisdom. In your love, you save us. We pray for the whole creation. Overthrow evil powers, right what is wrong, feed and satisfy those who thirst for justice, so that all your children may freely enjoy the earth you have made, and joyfully sing your praises. Hear us as we pray for the church. You've called us to be the church of Jesus Christ. Keep us one in faith and service, breaking bread together and proclaiming the good news to the world that all may believe you are love and turn to your ways and live in the light of your truth. Hear us as we pray for peace. You sent us a Savior, Jesus Christ, to break down the walls of hostility that divide us. Send peace on earth and put down greed, pride, and anger, which turns nation against nation and race against race. Speed the day when wars will end and the whole world will accept your rule. Hear us as we pray for our enemies. 
We cannot love you unless we love our neighbors, all of our neighbors. Remove hate and prejudice from us and from all people so that your children may be reconciled with those we fear, resent, or threaten and live together in your peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear us as we pray for those who govern us. You are the sovereign over all nations. Direct those who make, administer, and judge our laws. Grant to the President of the United States and to all others in authority over us that they may be given wisdom and a sense of justice, compassion, and humility, looking to you for guidance. Hear us as we pray for the sick. Merciful God, you bear the pain of the whole world. Look with compassion upon those who are sick. Cheer them by your word and bring healing as a sign of your grace. Stand with those who are in sorrow, that they may be sure that neither death nor life nor things present or yet to come will separate them from your love. These are our common concerns as a church, O oh Lord, and together we join our voices as one as we continue to address you as our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen.
your kingdom come. Oh, may my will and yours be one, my heavenly Father. Our Old Testament lesson for today comes from Psalm 32, beginning with verse 1, continuing through verse 11. Let us listen to the word of the Lord. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin in the, the Lord does not count against him, in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of the summer. And then I acknowledged my sin to you, and you did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while he may be found. Surely, when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. And also this reading from the New Testament from 1 John chapter 1, beginning with verse 5, continuing through verse 9. This is the message we have heard from him and we declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, and yet we walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. This is the reading from the word of the Lord. An elderly woman walked into a local church. Uh, friendly usher greeted her at the door, helped her up the flight of steps and asked, where would you like to sit? I'd like to sit in the front row, she said. Oh, you really don't want to do that, said the usher. Our pastor is boring. And if you zone out during the sermon, it'll be more comfortable for you on the back row. Do you know who I am, said the elderly woman, very irate all of a sudden? No, said the usher. Who are you? I am the pastor's mother. The usher looked at the older woman and said, do you know who I am? And the woman said, no. He said, good, let's keep it that way. <laughs> we all make mistakes, but none of us want to be caught making a mistake. Several years ago, my then 13-year-old son came home one day and, uh, after school and he asked me to cut his hair. Now, I know a no-win situation when I see one. And I told him there was no way I was going to cut his hair. I knew the slightest mistake or problem would lead to him blaming me for days or weeks. My son had suddenly realized that he had the world's ugliest haircut. I could have told him that. And I tried to on several occasions. It looked like somebody had taken a bowl and put it on his head, just trimmed the edges. He looked more like Mo from the Three Stooges than my son. And all of a sudden, he wanted a military-style haircut. You, you know the style. It's almost a bald head. And for some reason, he wanted to save money. And he wanted me to take my clippers that I used to trim my beard and to shave his head. 
Well, as I said, I know no win situations when I see one. And uh, so I told him, if you want to cut your hair, you're welcome to it. So he took my clippers and he started giving himself a haircut. And he went out in the backyard so he wouldn't make a mess. And I stood at the den uh, window and watched him. And he went around the ear, a little bit higher. And then they stopped. Suddenly there was no sound at all. My tremors, which were rechargeable, had run out of power. Uh, he no longer looked like Mo from the Three Stooges, but more like an alien from another world. He was almost completely bald on one side and, and had a good head of hair on the other side. And he, in a panic, he ran inside and asked me how long it took to recharge the clippers. And I said, normally I, I leave them plugged in overnight. Well, I had to drive him to the nearest emergency barber shop. We went in and the barber looked at my son and asked, what in the world happened to you? And my son, without a moment's hesitation, said, my dad tried to give me a haircut. <laughs> we hate to admit mistakes. And the Apostle John addresses this human quality in today's passage when he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Most of us find it hard to admit that we have said or made any mistakes at all. If a barber makes a mistake, you can call it a new hairstyle. If your boss makes a mistake, he'll probably say it was your mistake. If a driver makes a mistake, it's an accident. But if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We need to some honesty in our lives and that means among other things we need to be honest with ourselves how many of us if we felt a lump on a breast or a mole began to look suspicious we felt a pain in our chest would ignore it well actually i know a lot of people who would ignore these signs they deny that they could possibly be sick so what happens the lump becomes a cancer that cannot be treated. The chest pains become a fatal heart attack. But healthy people know that the thing to do is not to deny those warning signals, but to attend to them, address them. Be honest with yourselves. Take care of your physical health. And you cannot take care of your spiritual health if you deny you have any problems. There are things in your life that separate you from God and from one another. If we say that they are not there, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. The hatred that you feel for someone you see every day, the lies that you tell, the theft of something that doesn't belong to you, the lust in your heart or the affair that you had behind the back of your spouse, the racism, the selfishness. Be honest with yourself. We need to address these mistakes, errors, and sins if we are to be spiritually healthy. We need to be honest with ourselves. Now the temptation is to look at other people and think they have sinned. And they need to be honest with themselves and they need to admit their mistakes. It's easier after all to see the sin of others. Don't do that. Look at yourself in the mirror, the spiritual mirror. See your own sin. Look at yourself and think how you need to be honest with yourself. And that's just the first step in the right direction. If we have a pain in our chest and admit to ourselves, I've got chest pains, I've got to go to the doctor to do something about it. Uh, well, that's, that's a good thing but, uh, to think that, but it's, it's not enough. You actually have to get in the car and go to the doctor. And say, I've got chest pains, there's something wrong with my physical health. If we admit that there are no sins in our lives, uh, we are deceiving ourselves. If we admit that there are sins, that's a good thing. But the next is to be honest to God, not just to ourselves. To say to God, I have sinned. There's something wrong with my spiritual health. 
Being honest with ourselves is one thing. Confessing your sins to God, that's the next step. And it's hard enough to admit our mistakes to ourselves, but to admit them to anyone else, even to God, is, is, is difficult. In the essential Calvin and Hobbes by Bill Watterson, the cartoon character Calvin says to his tiger friend Hobbes, I feel badly that I called Susie names. I know I hurt her feelings. I'm sorry I did that. Well, maybe you should apologize to her, says the tiger. And Calvin ponders this for a moment and then replies, Well, I keep hoping that there's a, a less obvious solution. When we want to restore our relationship with God, we need to remember that God has a liking for the obvious solution, confession, an apology to him. According to a legend, Frederick the Great, who was a king a couple of centuries ago, he was conducting a, an inspection of a prison in Berlin, and most of the prisoners begged for the king to have mercy, and, uh, and they protested their innocence, every one of them, but one man remained silent. Frederick asked the man what crime he had committed, if he was guilty of it. And the man replied humbly, yes, your majesty, I'm a thief. I deserve my punishment. Frederick reportedly, according to this legend, summoned the warden of the prison and ordered him to release the single guilty man at once. I will not have this guilty thief corrupting the souls of these innocent people in my fine prison. We get out of prison. When we confess and acknowledge to God that we are not innocent. But it's our usual human nature to refuse to admit that we've done anything wrong. We say we have no sin, which means we deceive ourselves. We need to do the obvious thing and admit our, to ourselves and to God what we've done. I read an article in Time Magazine a while back that said that many medical centers are now encouraging their doctors to apologize for major medical errors uh, as a tactic for heading off lawsuits. Now that would, that's big news. With malpractice insurance costing some doctors hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, and with so many lawsuits filed every year, the long-standing advice from insurers and hospital lawyers has been that the doctors should never apologize or admit fault. The fear was that to do so would spark even more lawsuits and give ammunition to the plaintiffs. The shift in admitting mistakes and apologizing can be traced actually 20 years ago to a study of a Veterans Affairs Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky. After losing two big lawsuits, the hospital ruled that its staff should discuss every medical mistake. Staff members began apologizing for harmed patients and they apologized to the patients and to their families, and they even discussed with the victims what they could do differently to avoid future errors with other people. And after putting that, that policy into effect, the hospital discovered that its court-ordered payouts dropped significantly. Many patients who had grounds to sue either chose not to or settled out of court for lesser amounts than they would likely have received if they'd gone to trial. It's human to think that, it, that we're better off if we admit no wrongdoing, but the reality is just the opposite. Admission and apology is a healing process. God is waiting for us to apologize. God is waiting for us to confess. John Alexander wrote in a magazine a few years ago, Sin is the best news there is, because with sin there's a way out. You can't repent of confusion or psychological flaws inflicted by your parents. You're stuck with them. You have to deal with them in other ways. But you can repent of sin. Sin and repentance are the only grounds for hope and joy, the grounds for reconciled and joyful relationships. It's time to be honest to God. Now, the temptation may be to look at other people and say, well, they've sinned, they need to get honest with God, but we need to look at ourselves and, and realize we need to be honest with God. 
But confession is not the last step. Imagine a husband and wife driving in a car and, and the husband's driving and, and the wife says, honey, uh, the map says you should turn right at the light. And by mistake, he turns left at the light. Uh, this may sound familiar to some of you. And now imagine the husband saying, well, I, I know I turned in the wrong direction, but if we stay on this road, uh, I think there's a shortcut from here to there. Wrong. The, the driver needs to turn around. He needs to make a U-turn. And that's what repentance is. Admitting a mistake is not enough. You actually have to turn around and go in the other direction. That is essentially what the word repent means in scripture, to turn around, to turn away from sin, to turn toward God, to turn from going in one direction and turn and go in the correct direction. Several years ago, the Peanuts comic strip had Lucy and Charlie Brown practicing football. And Lucy would hold the ball for Charlie's place kicking and then Charlie would try to kick the ball. And, and every time, Lucy held the ball for Charlie. He would approach the ball and kick with all of his might. And, and at the very last moment, instant, Lucy would yank the ball away. Charlie, with all of this momentum, would try to kick the ball that was no longer there. And he'd end up falling on his back. That was a running joke through the comic strips. And then one day, um, a particular comic strip... Uh, opened with Lucy holding the ball and Charlie Brown would not kick the ball. Lucy begged him to kick the ball. But Charlie Brown said, no, every time I try to kick the ball, you remove it and I fall flat on my back. And they went back and forth and finally Lucy broke down in tears and admitted, Charlie Brown, I have been so terrible to you over the years, picking up the football like I have. I've played so many dirty tricks on you. I've seen the errors of my ways. I, I, I look in your eyes and I see the hurt and the pain that I've caused. And I was wrong. I was so wrong. Won't you give a poor penitent girl just one more chance? And Charlie Brown was moved by her display of grief and responded to her, of course, I'll give you another chance. He stepped back as she held the ball and he ran and at the last moment Lucy picked up the ball and Charlie Brown fell flat on his back and L Lucy's last words were recognizing your faults and actually changing your ways are two different things Charlie Brown. Now the temptation may be to look at other people and say well they've sinned, they've fallen short of the glory of God. It's easy to see that. But we need to look at ourselves, look at our own sin, and we need to be honest to God, and we need to be ready to change our ways. And now to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be ascribed all might, power, dominion, and glory, today and forever. Amen. See
And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Self there.